And now, welcome to the latest in the series of State Senator Bill Dodd's virtual town halls. Tonight's event is presented in partnership with KSVY 91.3 FM in Sonoma and Sonoma TV and features Marisa Lagos, California politics reporter for KQED Public Radio, Scott McKenzie, professor of political science at UC Davis, and Malia Cohen, chair of the Board of Equalization and state controller elect. Our subject tonight is the outcome of the November 8 election and its implications for Californians at the state and federal level. My name is Rick Wynn. I'm one of the volunteer hosts here at KSUI 91.3 FM in Sonoma. This evening's town hall is being presented on multiple video platforms, including Senator Dodd's Facebook page, facebook.com slash sendbilldodd, sdo3.senate.gov.ca, Sonoma TV, Comcast Channel 27 in the Sonoma Valley, and SonomaTV.org and Sonoma TV channel on YouTube. For audio only, tune in to KSVY 91.3 FM in Sonoma or stream on the KSVY.org or on your favorite home smart device. Again, tonight we're talking about the outcome of the November 8 election and its implications for California's at the state and federal levels. Senator Dodd and the panelists will take your questions at 6.30. The studio call in number is 707-933-9133. That's 707-933-9133. We also have questions previously submitted by email and we'll make every attempt to get to those not addressed by the panelists in their opening remarks and the subsequent discussion. Senator Bill Dodd represents all or part of six North Bay counties, including Napa, Sonoma, Solano, Contra Costa, Sacramento, and Yolo counties. And now I'll turn it over to Senator Dodd, who will make his opening remarks and further introduce this evening's panel. A good evening, Senator. Thank you very much, Rick. And thanks to our panelists for being here tonight. And of course, KSDY for convening this latest in a series of town halls. This is actually our 22nd monthly virtual town hall since 2020 when the pandemic started. And just uh, since it is Giving Tuesday, uh, Rick and Marty, uh, I am going to... Uh, pledge $500 uh, at the start of the show here uh, to send to KSVY. Appreciate all the great work you do locally in our community. Thank you so much. If you're keeping track, you'll notice that we took a brief pause towards the end of the legislation, le legislative session, excuse me, this year. So this is our first town hall actually since then. And tonight we'll discuss the results of the November 8th election and the implications on governing our state and nation. After, we will open the floor to your general questions. And I'm very glad to be joined by this incredibly distinguished group. And thanks to the hundreds of people tuning in tonight. Uh, the fact that you are here shows your concern. And later in the town hall, we'll be, re we'll be reading your email questions. We will start taking your calls at 630. The call in number is 707-933-9133. A great man once said, the vote is precious. It is the most powerful, nonviolent tool we have in our democratic society, and we must use it. Those words were from John Lewis, the late congressman and civil rights leader. They resonate today in our highly polarized nation as we consider midterm election results. Voters in California and across the country went to the polls on November 8th to make their voices heard on a number of candidates and issues that will play a significant role in our path forward. Most importantly, election day passed without feared violence or ballot shenanigans. The outcome was a win for democracy, although some final results are not yet certified. At the state level, we reelected our governor, Gavin Newsom, and ushered new statewide office holders, including one of my guests tonight, Malia Cohen. And I know that she's going to be on uh, shortly, but congratulations to her. Uh, we also ensured women's reproductive rights, approved funding for arts education, and banned the sale of flavored tobacco. And at the same time, we rejected competing measures on sports wagering, a proposed tax to support the purchase of electric vehicles, among other things. And on the national front, control of the House of Representatives appears to have changed uh, but the majority in the Senate remained the same. Interestingly, candidates supported by Donald Trump fared poorly, as did those who denied the 2020 presidential election results. With any luck, we are now leaving that dark era in the past. 
But regardless of where you stand, you exercise your fund- fundamental right to vote. That act is essential, and you did it peacefully and securely. In the coming weeks, as the final results come in, we hope to get a better read on the overall turnout. But preliminary estimates suggest it was high for a midterm election. It is an encouraging sign for those in these acrimonious times. Here tonight are three people to talk about the election and its implications for Californians. I already told you about Malia Cohen, who was elected November 8th to be our state's next controller. It was a historic vote. She became the state's first black controller. It is a role that involves dispersing state funds, auditing government agencies, and serving on more than 70 boards and commissions. This is obviously important as California faces uncertain economic future with a projected $25 billion shortfall. Ms. Cohen was chair of the state's Board of Equalization after previously serving as president of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. Also with us tonight is Scott McKenzie, political science professor at UC Davis. Scott is an expert in American politics. His specific area of focus include California politics, state and local government, political development, and political methodology. Some of his most recent work is extended into policy analysis and reform, including the criminal justice system. And he recently received a major grant from the U.S. Department of Agriculture to study agriculture and water policy in California. And finally, we have Marisa Lagos, correspondent for KQED's California Politics and Government uh, Desk, and co-host of the weekly show and podcast, Political Breakdown. At KQED, Lagos conducts reporting, analysis, investigations into state, local, national politics for radio, TV, and online. I kind of have to go off script here and say to Marisa, uh, I've been on your Political Breakdown show. I hope you have as much fun tonight as I had on your show. But now, Do you uh, have any old high school pictures of me? Because I think that was the best part of that show. I think that was. that You guys surprised me. Uh, but that's, uh, uh, we may do that at the end of the show if we have fewer questions. But let's bring it back now to, uh, to Rick and uh, get on the first guest. Thank you very much. So I'm not okay, sure. I think we'll start with start, we'll start off with Scott McKenzie tonight. Perfect, Professor McKenzie. Uh, thanks, Rick, and uh, thanks, Senator Dodd. I'd, I'd just like to start by thanking the senator um, for his many years of great service to the district and to the state of California. I tell my students, it's not easy being an elected official. It's a big sacrifice, and that sacrifice extends um, to family and, and staff as well. So. Um, just thanks for all of your your great service and um, looking forward to, to seeing you continue that. On uh, on the election, there's a couple of themes I'd, I'd just like to highlight here, and then maybe at the end, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of the implications. Um, and mostly, I'll just focus on sort of big picture and, and maybe leave the whys to some of the question and answer. The first point, I think, concerns turnout. And the Senator Dodd mentioned, you know, turnout was pretty good uh, for a midterm election. Uh, as of now, it looks like around 46.9% or so of the voting eligible population. And that doesn't sound like a lot, it's less than half, but, you know, historically this is pretty high. And, you know, just 10, 15 years ago, the standard was, was somewhere around 35, 36%. And so this is basically the third election in a row where we've had fairly high turnout. And, you know, turnout's important to look at um, first as a signal of political engagement, how active citizens are in expressing their views and oftentimes maybe dissatisfaction. But of course, in California, turnout takes uh, in a midterm takes a extra special reason because it's actually how we set the thresholds for qualifying ballot measures. And so when turnout's really high, it means, you know, it's harder to qualify ballot measures going forward. And when turnout's a little bit lower, it's uh, it's easier. And so compared to at least 2018, the last midterm election that we had in California, turnout's lower, which means some of those thresholds going forward will be a little bit lower. But, you know, I, I do think the, the main sort of important thing to focus on, at least nationally, is, you know, we're, we're in an era of abnormally high turnout. And, you know, I think that's a good thing. 
Second thing I'd, I'd highlight is, you know, we're also in an era of very slim partisan majorities uh, in Washington, D.C. Since the Republicans retook the House in 1994 after several decades of Democratic control, basically the size of the House Majority Party has been around 55 percent or lower. And it looks like, you know, when all the ballots are counted and all the seats are allocated, the Republicans will have a, uh, a nine seat majority uh, in the House, 222 to 213, which is basically the mirror image of where we are right now, where Democrats um, had a nine seat majority in Biden's first two terms. And so, you know, like uh, Nancy Pelosi these last two years, the new Speaker of the House on the Republican side will have a quite uh, very little margin for error. Uh, you'll also have a House uh, that's divided from the Senate, which will be continued uh, control for the Democratic Party. And of course, you know, President Biden will be president uh, for two more years. And so we're entering a period of divided government with very narrow majorities, and that'll put a premium on the ability of, you know, leadership to push through the kinds of legislation that need to happen regardless of control, including things like funding the government uh, and so forth. But it also gives, you know, Republicans an opportunity to uh, frustrate uh, initiatives at the federal level and, you know, make Democrats in the chamber take take tough votes. Uh, at the state level, we have almost the, ex the exact opposite happening. Instead of, you know, more divided control of government, we have lots and lots of unified government. In fact, after this current election, only 10 of the 50 states will actually have divided control between the legislative and executive branches. And so there are lots of states out there like California that have unified control of um, state government. And in an era, you know, at least in the next two years, where you're not going to get majorities to support big initiatives like the infrastructure bill or the recovery plan, a lot of the impetus will be uh, at the state level. Uh, in California, of course, uh, the Democratic Party will continue to enjoy very large majorities in the legislature. And so, you know, the election really didn't change a whole lot uh, as far as control of state government is concerned. Democrats swept every statewide elected office, much as they have in recent years. In fact, since 1996, no Republican not named Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, has won a statewide election in California. And so, you know, looking forward, it'll be incumbent upon Democrats to continue to be good stewards of majority status. And, you know, it looks like they'll be doing it um, with, a, with a bit of a poor fiscal outlook. At least if revenue projections are correct, it looks like the state will be dealing with a $25 billion budget deficit, and it'll be interesting to see how the new majorities in, in the state Senate and the Assembly, which will be among the most diverse uh, in California history, will, will deal with those problems and, you know, continue to tackle problems like climate change um, and uh, homelessness. Uh, I could say a little bit about um, initiatives and uh, looking forward, but I think, you know, I've already said uh, about five minutes of, of remarks, and so maybe I'll just reserve those for, for the question and answer and, and, and pass it on. You're muted. You are muted. You know, you think by now you would have it so that you could unmute yourself on time. But nevertheless, um, thank you very much, Scott. Now we're going to move to Marisa Lagos. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much for inviting me back, Senator. I don't remember when the last time we did this was, but I think it was the depths of the pandemic. So I appreciate a slightly better times. Um, <clears throat> I will keep it kind of California focused because I feel like a lot of the national stuff um, we might get questions about or we can talk about, but I would say uh, this election was a bit of a snooze from a California perspective. Um, there was not any huge surprises in the statewide races, obviously. Um, the I would say it was a good night for Governor Gavin Newsom. Um, he not only sailed to re-election, but um, managed to kill Prop 30, the uh, ballot measure that would have raised funds uh, by taxing millionaires by, you know, to fund electric charging stations and some wildfire uh, fighting efforts. That was a piece of strange bedfellows for the governor with the uh, Howard Jarvis Tax Association and Chamber and others. Um, but uh, just talking to folks involved in that campaign on both sides, I think the governor coming out against it really sort of sealed the deal for that. Um, 
sports betting was not a great night. I'm sorry, Senator. Uh, I think Props 26 and 27 uh, show that, you know, money can buy you votes, but they, it doesn't always. Um, that was a remarkable amount of money spent all before I think Labor Day. Um, and they just, I, I mean, these, num- I was just looking at the numbers. They're really dismal. It's kind of impressive. Uh, I don't recall other ballot measures with that sort of lopsided, but I think that also shows how hard it is when you have two um, competing measures, because I think the negativity really sort of took a toll on both of those. Um, what else? Congressional races. Uh, I, I've been meaning to tally up how much money we're spent in all those swing, swing districts, none of which seem to have changed hands. We're still waiting on one or two, but, um, you know, I think a lot of the sort of heartache on the Democratic side ahead of the election about Katie Porter's district and Mike Levin's district and some of the excitement about the possibility of taking Ken Calvert's district and uh, potentially the Central Valley one, David Valadeo's just nothing really, nothing really changed. Uh, And it's funny because we all thought California could kind of mean the difference between, you know, Republican or Democratic control, but uh, honestly, the numbers didn't change much. Um, I'll just wrap by saying uh, one of the biggest spenders in this election was oil companies. And I think that's not shocking given that we do have a a potential special session ahead where the governor is proposing to uh, tax or however you want to say a windfall profit tax uh, on oil companies. Um, There was just a hearing today at the Energy Commission, which all the oil companies boycotted. Um, One thing that sort of fascinates me about the way that politics has changed in California, and I think the oil spending really shows this, is just how strong of a democratic state it's become, right? So you really have not traditional, just Republican versus Democratic contest, but um, spending within Democrat on Democrat legislative races uh, by business or labor or whoever else. Um, and I think it's an interesting bet because, you know, not all of those folks may actually end up voting with the people that spent millions of dollars on their campaigns. Um, so that's what I'll be watching. I will say I don't expect from what I'm hearing that y'all will be taking any votes on that oil uh, proposal until the new year, but um, we are looking for some details from the governor. And I think you know, who the new class is will certainly impact how that and other climate talks uh, progress in 23. Thank you very much, Marisa. Uh, Now uh, we're going to be talking to our new, (laughs) newly elected controller of the state of California, somebody I've supported, has been a friend of mine uh, for quite some time. As I told you on the top of the show before she got on, she was the president of the San Francisco uh, Board of Supervisors. She was also Uh, chair of the uh, Board of Equalization in the state of California. She's the first black state controller in the history of our great state. And somebody that I know comes to this job with great passion, great intelligence, and uh, just, uh, I think, a willingness to to really serve her constituents throughout the state of California. So Malia Cohen, welcome. Hello, everyone. Good evening. It's so good to see you. Thank you, Senator Dodd, for inviting me. Give me an opportunity just to share my perspective. Hello to my old friend, Marisa. Good to see you, Scott. Hopefully we'll be, be friends one day. Um, but nonetheless, you know, for me, I think the key takeaway um, on a national level is that the young people came up, they flexed their muscles, and they are ruling it. They ruled this election cycle. They ruled last election cycle. And I believe that they have come to rule. And I'm talking about 18 to 24 year old, 18 to 34, if I'm being generous. But nonetheless, we're talking about young people that have saved uh, democracy across this entire um, across this entire country, this election cycle. And um, one thing, one statistic that I read um, um, and for those of you that kind of watch politics on a, on a close national level, I'd love to get some dialogue on this, is that um, 70% of young voters between the ages of 18 to 24 would like to see a third party. And that's a pretty uh, high number. And uh, it would be very interesting to see what, how that manifests uh, in the next coming years as millennials continue to mature, uh, buy houses, have kids, uh, start businesses, and uh, continue to flex their political muscle. Um, One race that I'm really still interested in is this uh, runoff in Atlanta, and excuse me, in Georgia. 
Uh, we didn't really talk too much. I don't think we covered too much on that one, but that is uh, an interesting one. The uh, Senate seat, the, the uh, control of the Senate is not in the balance. Uh, the Democrats still have that, but um, I, I think just personally am riveted between uh, Reverend Warnock and then Mr. Herschel. I think that's just such an interesting mashup. So, um, Senator Dodd, I don't know if there's a, any other specific questions that are topics that you want me to speak to, but um, if you do, throw them out there and I'll, uh, I'll take a stab at it. Well, I think this is a good opportunity if Rick is uh, uh, nearby where we can start and get, get some questions uh, yeah. you know, asked. Uh, I, our... Hello, Rick. I, I, I've, got, I've, got some, I've got a list here, Senator, so <laughs> let's, uh, let's see what we have. Um, one of the one of the ones that I think everyone can comment on um, is what what are the uh, the results of the November eighth election um, and the change in the House of Representatives? How's that going to affect Californians? Anybody want to take a stab at that, Scott McKenzie? I can jump in. Oh yeah, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, why don't you go ahead, uh, Marissa, and I'll maybe I'll yeah. jump in after. I mean, it's interesting, right? We still we still have the speaker, probably assuming McCarthy can keep it together. Um, you know, I think that I don't know that you know things have changed in Congress over the past couple of decades in terms of like projects and bringing back money and things like that. We seem to have. Um, it's not to say that there isn't, you know, what's derisively called pork attached to bills and things like that. But I do think uh, Scott was saying at the top, you know, this is just going to be a harder Congress to get anything through. Um, and so I think that's something that will have national implications. We're not going to see another infrastructure bill, for example. We're not going to see some of the more aggressive parts of Biden's, I think, climate and economic agenda obviously be taken up by this House. Um, but Obviously, California will still have a speaker there. It will not be Nancy Pelosi after this long time. Um, and I think, you know, McCarthy is coming in with a lot less control of his caucus and in a much more precarious position, even though the numbers weren't that different for Democrats and they still struggled to hold it together with such a slim margin. Um, I think it's a even wilder task, let's say, uh, charitably, uh, for Kevin McCarthy. Um, <clears throat> So I do think, you know, that'll be a big difference. Obviously, there's like some policy things like, you know, McCarthy's opposed high speed rail and things like that. I don't know, again, like if any of that it was going to happen other than within the Biden administration in the coming years anyway. Um, so, yeah, I think I, I don't know. It seems like everything's become so nationalized now that there isn't the same kind of direct impact. But I'd be interested, Scott, if you have differing views. No, I think I, I agree with all that. Um, you know, I might add that, you know, Californian, Californians make up a, a much larger share of the Democratic caucus in the House than they do the Republican caucus in the House. There are, you know, 40, 40 members uh, from California who are Democrats. And if they had the majority, that would be a larger share of the majority than the 11 Republicans um, will form for the Republican majority. So you lose a little bit of influence uh, you'll also lose Nancy Pelosi's uh, historic leadership. Uh, and so, you know, it'll be a challenge for Speaker McCarthy if indeed he's successful in marshalling, you know, 218 votes to to become Speaker. But you'll also lose a little bit of influence around the margins with Californians no longer being in line for, you know, chairmanships of key committees and, and, and subcommittees. Um, so I would say if there's influence loss, that's probably where you'll where you'll see it. I would also add that, I mean, I think still McCarthy has a more challenging job, but I think uh, whoever the next Democratic leader is, it's looking like it might be Hakeem Jeffries from New York. Um, that'll be tough too. Like Nancy Pelosi is uniquely talented at what she does. And I think folks will appreciate that even more when she is uh, not in the leadership position. That's right. You don't miss your water until your, your well runs dry, right, Marissa? <laughs> For you, uh, Malia Cohen, a, a question. You've been elected. You have to state controller elect. Um, could you clarify what the state controller does for our audience and um, and what? Oh my God, what, what, Rick! What, <laughs> just yes. just real quick. Just just. I've only summary. been answering this question for the last year and a half. 
the last 20 months of my life, not a problem at all. So the state controller is the chief fiscal officer for the entire state of California. California is in a new position. It's now the fourth largest economy in the world. And uh, it helps administer uh, the largest pension plan. plan. Um, uh, she serves on over 70 different boards and commission. Our current controller is is Betty Yi. Uh, she is termed out. The controller's office is responsible for uh, the payroll system, um, uh, um, managing unclaimed property. I mean, there's several different programs that exist under here. But I think the key takeaway that people really grab onto is, is that the controller signs the checks. So the treasurer brings money into the state of California and the controller makes sure uh, that the money is there and then signs the checks, pays the bills, pay vendors, pay employees, pay retirees. And so that is uh, the most succinct way I have learned to talk about this phenomenal position. Do you expect that the downturn, the expected downturn in the California economy is going to make it harder to pay those bills? And how will we pay all those bills of programs that have been enacted by uh, propositions, et cetera? Well, that is a really good question. We, it, it's yet to be determined. Um, there are some bills that I know that we are going to be able to pay. Retirees, we're going to be able to pay, despite you know the widely popular unfunded liability that people like to talk about. I think that we will continue to honor that commitment to retirees. But we'll see what the budget says, what the legislature is, is passing forward, what programs um, are going to get funded and get uh, or get you know un unfunded. Largely, that's going to come out of uh, between the dance between the, the legislature and the governor's office. The beautiful thing about the controller's office is that she's independent. This is a position that is um, making sure that money is being spent well, making sure that there isn't any waste, any fraud. Um, so it's providing that level of oversight. I'll probably weigh in there too. Uh, the controllers, a number of times over the last 10 years, at least under two or three that I can remember, has really weighed in on some processes that the legislature and budgeting and a number of different things on the appropriateness of certain actions uh, on behalf of the legislature. Uh, the other thing about our budget going forward this year, I think the last couple of years as we've had all this large yes, we really uh, were circumspect on, first of all, because we had so much money, uh, we are constitutionally bound to give about 9.5 billion of that back in the form of that middle-class tax relief is what you know, what we did. Uh, in addition to that, we had, you know, which I think is really appropriate, where when you, you know, when, when you've got excess, you know, money and budget surpluses, you don't spend a lot of money on ongoing programs. You spend money on um, one-time programs. And the focus was, for us was, you know, certainly climate change, certainly uh, our transportation system, other infrastructure systems. And I fully expect because of our, uh, rainy day fund, which I think now um, Malia is probably around $37 billion or so uh, will yeah. really help us, uh, um, you know, not, not only will I think our leadership and the assembly leadership, the leadership in the Senate and the assembly be circumspect on this deficit. But in addition to that, uh, the governor already started it last year vetoing, I don't know, 12, 15 bills at least that didn't have any funding attached to them where normally they might just allow those bills to uh, become law. They didn't, he didn't because he, obviously the projections have been looking at this possibility for quite some time. And our list, I wanna remind our listeners that our phone lines are open at 707-933-9133. That's 707-933. 9133. We did have a call come in and the person didn't stay on the line, but they're wondering, you know, elections are such a, have been such a topic since 2020. Um, the question is kind of why does it take so long to count the ballots? Is voting by mail really a good thing? And are there election reforms that the state of California should undertake to smooth out these processes if, if they are broken? Um, let's go with Scott McKenzie on this first. That's a great question. I mean, the, you know, the, the important reasons that 
it takes so long to count ballots in California is first, we're the biggest state. And so, you know, we have millions and millions of more voters. Um, in recent elections, we've done a lot more vote by mail uh, and those take longer to count uh, and process. And of course, you know, in California, you know, it's important that all the votes get counted. And so uh, a lot of the counting takes place at sort of the county level where very hardworking um, election officials are, are still processing ballots um, as we speak. And given the number, the complexity of elections where you have lots of different ballot types, you know, vote by mail, uh, votes that come in on election day, absentee, and so forth. It just, it takes a long time to to get all of those ballots together. And not, a, not every county has the the same set of resources. And in some counties, it, it it just takes a little bit longer to to finalize the results. But the good news is every one of those votes gets counted. Marisa, do you have a comment on that? Uh, yeah, just to say, I mean, it, I think it's important to note the difference between counties, right, and, and the difference in resources and ability to do this. Um, and also that some races are harder and take longer to count because they span multiple counties, like uh, the David Valadeo Rudy Salas congressional race in the Central Valley. There's like four, dis you know, four counties. <laughs> They're all different registrar's offices. Um, and then, you know, we've changed a lot of rules. So while registrars are allowed to sort of prepare ballots to be counted. They can't start running them until election day. We allow people's ballots to arrive up to three days late. I mean, there's, you know, there's a, there's a lot of good reasons that um, even in the bigger, more resource counties, we've just given people more time. I will let the politicians say whether all of this is good or bad. The consensus of the two of you is that we're doing the best we can and there's no election reforms that are necessary going forward. Well, I think there's always room for reform. There's always room to continue to get to better our best, um, particularly when I'm thinking about um, the future. We need to make sure that um, our um, software that is used to process these ballots, that it is able to maintain its integrity, that you can't hack a system, that you can't steal an election. So I think that there is always going to be, as, as technology evolves and improves, that there will be uh, advances to how we vote. Um, I don't know, maybe it'll be a retina scan. Who knows? I'm just throwing this out there, but there will always be, as long as we're having elections, we will always have discussions on how we can make the process more fair, um, more transparent. Um, here in the state of California, I think we've done a very good job of eliminating obstacles. Want to note that we also have allowed people who have paid their debts to society uh, to uh, who have gone to jail and and now also have the uh, their right to vote restored. Um, these are important constituencies that have historically been left off. I mean, you know, uh, if you were on probation or parole, if you were on um, pr pr probation, you could vote, but if you were on parole, you couldn't. Um, but we've changed that. So there are still tweaks, and I think there is still room to continue to um, create systems and then um, maintain the systems that we are created, making sure that they are robust um, in terms of transparency. So maybe we could start to get a more, uh, a quick, a quicker turnaround, uh, but different county have different resources. Registrar's offices are also assessors are also sometimes county treasurers. And so smaller counties have, they're wearing multiple hats. And so we just going to, um, you know, sit back and this is what I call election season. No more election night, right, Senator Dodd? I mean, this is an election season and we will just um, um... The good news is that we have high turnouts which cause those kind of complications in terms of counting. Uh, we do have Gary on the phone from San Francisco with a question about um, the uh, uh, culture of uh, campaigns. Gary, you're on. Thanks for putting this together, Senator Dodd. It's really enlightening. Um, I know some of the panelists here personally, but my question is, what can we do to change the culture of the negative, nasty level? It, it seems to get worse every election cycle. The nasty level of hit pieces of negative TV advertising, of smearing people's lives who run for public office. I'm interested what the panel and uh, has to say about are there any ideas you have about what we could do to change that? Well, you know, the I'll start because I'll tell you, I was uh, 
you know, attacked roundly uh, when I was running for the state assembly and the state Senate. And it's not really even by your opponent, but it's for people that either, you know, the, it, these independent expenditure accounts that either don't want you or want your, want your opponent, whatever, you know, the, the, the case may be. And, you know, truth has nothing to do with those. I even had them hammering on my opponent and saying some things that were frankly appalling to me. And I actually got involved and said, I don't support that. But you know, the, I think that those t- the, the rules for the independent expenditures have to hit, you know, have to be reviewed. It's, I think you're right. It is appalling and uh, it is negative. But you know, I, I, it'd really be interesting to hear from you know, Scott or Marisa to see if it really does in, in your minds, you know, make a difference. You know, I'm focused pretty much internally on, uh, it didn't matter in mine, I don't think, but uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts. Well, I don't have any genius ideas to stop people from being terrible, but um, I would say, (laughs) I think it depends on the campaign and the candidates. Um, Certainly there is, you know, even in races, you know, if they're, if they're very close, I do think that negative ads can make a difference, right? I mean, just like psychologically, you see this stuff over and over again. And even if you don't actually believe it, I think it, it takes hold. Um, I also just think you have to understand how so many voters are pretty low information. And so what they're seeing may only be the attack ads, right? So I do think that it can make a difference. Um, you know, I think it's different in candidate races versus like ballot measure races. It's always easier to get somebody to say no to, to a ballot measure. Um, but yeah, I, and I think it's one of those things that it, we talk about every year and it's something that voters hate. And yet there's, again, not a huge incentive to stop doing it because it does seem to work. So um, I don't know, we, we might need a psychology professor to, to, to get a better read on this one, honestly. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just add on that. Um, you know, the bad news is that negative advertising tends to work. Um, voters tend to remember it. And, you know, negative advertising isn't necessarily bad in itself to the extent that it highlights differences between candidates or parties. You know, it can be a good thing. It can be an opportunity for voters to, to learn some things. I think, you know, um, Senator Dodd's right that, you know, part of what drives negative advertising, at least in California, are rules that allow independent expenditure committees to, to raise money and and run ads against a candidate without the opponent who those ads benefit having to own it. So it's like we outsource negativity um, while escaping blame uh, for having to to raise those ideas yourself. And, you know, so you could you could talk about, you know, campaign finance reforms that would that would maybe cut down on some of these independent expenditure attack ads. There are other electoral reforms that people talk about, like ranked choice voting, which gives people an incentive when they're running for office, not to be too hard on their opponents, hoping to sort of get second and third place votes. But I think that's a, that would be a pretty radical change to how we do things, at least now, except for in some cities in California. Um, So, you know, there's a lot of ways we could, we could sort of reduce it, but these would be pretty big changes. The last thing I'll say is I think the negative advertising should be sort of seen separately as I think what Gary was sort of getting at, which is the intense and increasing dislike that partisans have for the other side. Uh, And in political science, we call this affective polarization. You dislike somebody simply because they represent um, the other party. And, you know, part of the problem is, you know, Democrats and Republicans can say almost anything about the other side and not face the same sort of social consequences that you do when you say something nasty about somebody of a different race or religion or or gender and so forth. And how you cut down on that problem, I think, uh, is the real puzzle that everybody who does what I do uh, wants to know the answer to. Follow-up question on that that was asked was, uh, what role do you think misinformation or disinformation played in the election? And and, uh, I mean, obviously Twitter is in turmoil um, and they are, have been over time a primary provider of disinformation and misinformation, but how how is that to be dealt with going forward? Uh, Marisa? easy questions from the audience tonight. How do we save democracy? Um, You know, as you were reading the question, I was thinking that it's interesting how 
how my response to this has changed since say 2016, um, when there was obviously documented, you know, attempts. And I think there was this year as well by, by foreign entities to influence folks. But I mean, I, I, at this point, it almost feels like mis and disinformation are steeped into our entire system because so many people um, have, you know, ideas, including lies spread by the former president that the last election, you know, was rigged, which it was not. So I, it's, that is an example of how this has become part of the cultural zeitgeist in a way that it's almost hard to disentangle elections from mis and disinformation. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not just picking on Republicans. There is a lot of misinformation online to go around and a lot of theories and craziness. Um, but obviously when you have a former president spreading it, it it's a different situation. So, um, you know, I think some of this will be sort of with an eye towards the future, raising younger people who are more discerning about what they read online and where they get their information. And, you know, just sort of, you know, I, I think we have all been part of a great experiment for the last 20 years with the advent of the internet and social media. Um, and, you know, who knows where this all goes. Twitter does seem to be literally heading off the rails more and more every day. Um, but it, it's, I don't know, it's just something that's going to be incumbent on all of us. And I know it, it can be challenging, I know, within families and everything um, to sort of push back against. Well, you know, even in these propositions, Sometimes the people that even for and against propositions, they never let facts get in the way uh, of a good story or a good presentation uh, for w whatever they want. It was interesting to see, I think the Chronicle did it, a number of different news outlets did some fact checking without getting into the merits of 26 and 27, but those were brought up earlier. And both sides uh, uh, really the, the accuracy of what they were saying on those ads were quite appalling. And I think also uh, that extended to a few of the other initiatives. Scott, do you have any comments on this? I don't have much to add there. I guess, um, you know, one of the things about misinformation is that the types of folks who are willing to believe in something like a Pizzagate conspiracy or, you know, other types of conspiracies are are not really the voters in the middle. And so, you know, there's a selection problem that, you know, the types of folks who, who end up following this stuff are, are, are not persuadable in the, in the first place. That doesn't, that doesn't downplay the overall just corrosive effects it has on democratic deliberation. And, and, you know, especially when the misinformation concerns things that, you know, are vital to people's lives like COVID and, and other things, I think, um, you know, it's important, but at least as far as determining outcomes of elections, I think um, maybe some of the fears are not as great as, as some people would make them out to be. Uh, another question in, um, let's see, where, <laughs> where was it? Where was it? Um, the, the two propositions that you've talked about, I guess, are the gambling propositions mostly. Uh, were there other propositions on the ballot that surprised you or... Um, uh, did not surprise you in terms of how they did? And do you, what do you see in propositions in the future? Are there some in the churning now? Well, let's, let's bring one up, the, the, the dialysis. I mean, how many, the dialysis uh, uh, initiative. We've had that on our ballots three times. This is all, I mean, look, let's get real. Uh, I support all our nurses and our, you know, people that have just done amazing jobs for us during COVID and everything else. But this clearly is, is a union play that has not worked. It has not resonated with voters. Now, granted, uh, DaVita and Fres Fresenius and, and other dialysis uh, companies have spent an awful lot of money. Uh, and that's uh, you know, maybe part of the strategy for the people that are writing these uh, ballot initiatives. But I, I don't know, for me, the direct democracy was a good reason uh, that it was put in, uh, you know, in the first place. But uh, I, I'll tell you, what, what I see is a lot of folks, uh, you wouldn't believe how many emails or texts I get asking me, hey, what, what, what would you, how, if you were me, what would you vote on? On these people don't have the time, the inclination. And while we had fewer this, fewer ballot initiatives this time, uh, they weren't all as straightforward as we'd like to see. 
Malia, any other comments on that? Well, you know, I wanted to go back. I uh, My internet has decided to be unstable. Of course, while I need her, she's decided to punk out on me. But if I heard correctly, Gary was asked about um, uh, the lies. And one of the things that I have been thinking about is the way that we, the way, you know how when you're watching a political commercial and there is a disclaimer on the bottom third of the screen, and then it lists the three top uh, funders for this initiative, that level of disclosure and transparency, I think is very helpful. For me, uh, it tells you where the priorities are, who's lining up, and then you can kind of connect the dots on why they're there. I think there needs to be some kind of a process also. When you are putting information out there, a commercial, there should be a vetting process. You say that there, you say, you say a statement and be able to cite your source, a credible source, and that there be some kind of a um, um, way, mechanism to verify that what is being proposed either in a commercial or in print, or even on the digital media, social media platforms, that there's some way that a voter can say that this is this is actually a true statement. Because as of right now, because of free speech, that you can say any kind of lie, you can completely discredit um, uh, people through through a lie. And I think that that's a horrible, vicious cycle. Um, in particular, it's something that I saw consistently throughout um, that the, the Republicans did throughout the um, throughout the entire country on their style of campaigning. Now, to speak to um, the initiatives, I think about Proposition 1, the uh, legislation to codify a woman's reproductive right. I mean, we knew that it would pass. I think that that was a good statement, um, um, statement of values of where the state of California stands in this discussion. Um, I think that um, the people that are elected to lead and to represent California, when they're back in Washington, D.C., they'll be able to pivot back to this election and say, look, um, these number of voters have stood up and they said that they want to protect a woman's right to choose. And, um, you know, I'm sure Kevin McCarthy is going to have a different uh, a take on that, but you cannot refute the way people, millennials, the way women have st stood up on this election cycle. Um, another initiative that I thought was uh, also interesting uh, besides the gaming was, um, oh, it just escaped me. Um, I'm not quite sure, but in the future, they'll probably, uh, uh, when I think about other initiatives that didn't quite make it on the ballot this cycle, that will probably make it uh, in the on the future election cycles, uh, revisiting um, some way, shape, or form Prop 13. And this is no longer a statement in support or against, but this is something that um, has to be addressed on the Board of Equalization. I deal with property taxes. Um, and uh, there was a Prop 19 that changed the way property is transferred from parent to child and grandchild to grandparent um, that has had an implication on farmers that has had an implicate a negative implication uh, on um, on um, on taxpayers. Um, so there is going to still be, I think, some more conversation around uh, a coalition that's that's building momentum and that will will be bringing an an, an issue um, a um, an, an issue similar to restoring. Um, the way property is transferred uh, back to where it was uh, from 2020, 2019. Okay, we have a couple of questions that, that came in. Um, uh, it, it's a completely different subject. Uh, pardon me, we've only got a couple of minutes left, but um, these might be quick yes or no or, or date questions. Uh, given that there's a target for all vehicle sales to be EV by 2035, is there a similar target date for all Californians to be able to know they will be able to afford to charge their EVs? Well, absolutely. Um, I don't know that there's a specific target in that, yeah, in that degree, but certainly um, if you've got an electric vehicle, your electric costs for that electric vehicle are certain, most certainly going to be less than, you know, th than the cost of gas. I mean, that's, I get a statement every single month from, you know, I, I drive a Tesla, I've been driving it for five years. And I'll tell you, it is the best, still the best vehicle uh, I've ever driven. And I'm going to continue, you know, I'm already way over a hundred thousand miles and it's just, the performance is great, but every single month they, they know where I charge and how I charge, and they put a cost to that and compare it, uh, you know, to you know buying gasoline at the pump. And so, 
I, I think that, that that is always going to be, uh, you know, uh, certainly a, a financial benefit, but knowing and understanding that we're going to have uh, the charging infrastructure through throughout the state of California is incredibly important. And, and that's something that I think that we are really looking very hard in the infrastructure bills that we put in this year between the Senate, the Assembly, and the Governor's Office. We put an immense amount of money in uh, for charging stations, and that is job one. The other thing we need to do is really visit. Uh, uh, I don't like having all my eggs in one basket. I'm not really a, a big believer that the electric vehicle should be 100% of what we have. We have a lot of people in apartments, uh, people that can't have chargers, uh, and uh, you know, perhaps once we get the hydrogen highway built for bigger vehicles and everything, there'll be an outlet so that you know, hydrogen could be a focus for the future. But that's what we need to do is to have more technology and more opportunities uh, for uh, innovation. And that's really, we're, we're sitting here today coming on 2023, that's 12 years away. That's not to say that the electric internal combustion engines going away in 2035. It just means all new vehicles from that point forward. Um, that's a, that's a gonna just about wrap it up for us. I have an apology to Andrew M. He asked a question about gun control and security guards, but I could not understand the question well enough to ask it. I apologize. Uh, Senator, you've got a couple of minutes to wrap it up. Well, I just want to really take the opportunity to uh, uh, thank KSVY and you, Rick, for doing this yet 20 second uh, uh, event here uh, on Zoom. And Scott McKenzie from UC Davis, thank you very much for, for being here with us. We see that iconic water tower in the background taking your time tonight. Uh, Marisa, uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry I didn't check the internet for pictures of you going back to high school that I could kind of haunt you on. But thank you for taking your time, uh, you know, to be here with me tonight. I really appreciate it. And to our new controller, congratulations. Uh, really looking forward to working with, continuing to working with you. You're just moving from one spot to a much larger spot. I know you're going to do a good job. Thank you very much for being with us. And folks, thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next month. And by the way, happy holidays, everybody. Happy it's holidays, nice. Senator Dodd. And let's get and along. Thank you. Let's, yeah, come, let's get along. Thank you all very much for being with us. And, and again, uh, today is Giving Tuesday. It's a celebration of good works and uh, all the stuff that we do here at KSVY and KSVY Sonoma TV um, and all the other nonprofits that, uh, that you are um, familiar with. So please consider KSVY in your Giving Tuesday uh, donations. That's KSVY.org. Thank you all very much. And again, have a happy holiday. Thank you.